I never thought we would ever buy, a laser power meter. They are just too bloody expensive, and only have a single function. But here we are. We bought this thing on Taobao for about $80. Given that hobby grade devices, typically cost hundreds of dollars, and lab grade ones can cost thousands, then this makes it pretty much the lowest cost laser power meter available. So, now we are going to test this little thing, tear it down, and even show you how it works. Right, let's get on with it. The basic specifications for this product are as follows. It can measure from 0 to 10 watts of optical power. It has a spectral range of 200 to 1060 nanometers. And it has a stated accuracy of plus and minus 2%. This orifice on the side of the device, is the laser beam input port. It's pretty large and can accommodate the beam from all of the laser pointers that we own. And it has a retro LED display, which frankly is pretty funky. I don't think that there is really any practical benefit of this type of display, but it does set it apart from other products on the market. To be honest, we quite like the way that this little thing looks. It is slightly larger than a matchbox, and feels pretty rugged in the hand. It's really simple to use, just a point and click process. There are no calibrations to set, and unless you open the device up, there is actually no way to even perform a calibration at all. Okay, let's get on and test this instrument with some actual lasers. Losing your eyesight is no joke, so my human assistant will be wearing laser safety glasses for the duration of these measurements. This is a green, diode pumped, solid state laser. Like all of our lasers, it is very cheap and we need to treat what is written on the label, as being a marketing statement, instead of an actual specification. In this case, the label claims that this is a 532 nanometers, class 3 laser, with an output under 100 milliwatts. Let's see about that. Indeed, using this spectrometer, we can see that the main emission line is correct. The instructions say that this device needs about 5 seconds to get a stable reading, but we found it took at least 20 seconds to stabilize. In the end, this instrument finally stabilizes at a value of about 65 milliwatts which actually makes it a class 3B laser. This is a red laser pointer, which claims to be a 650 nanometer, class 3B device with a power output under 100 milliwatts. Using the spectrometer, we see that the wavelength is incorrect, the measured value is actually 660 nanometers. After the power measurement stabilizes, we get a level of 68 milliwatts for this laser. This agrees with the device label and also the stated class for this product. So far, so good. Next up, we have a violet laser with a stated wavelength of 405 nanometers, a rated power of less than 1 milliwatt and which claims to be a class 2 laser. When checking the wavelength of the emission with a spectrometer, it seems to agree with the specification for this laser. But, when we look at the output power, we see something quite alarming. Instead of less than 1 milliwatt of power that we are expecting, we are getting about 58 milliwatts of output from this laser. So, this is actually a class 3B laser, not a class 2 device. This next laser, is part of a novelty device that has a white LED, a UV LED, and a red laser integrated into a small package. Which makes it, multispectral. Anyway, it claims to have a wavelength of 650 nanometers, an output power under 1 milliwatt, and to have a class 3A rating. Looking at the results from the spectrometer, we can confirm that the wavelength specification is correct. 
The output from this little laser, appears to be below the detection threshold for this instrument. But, instead of being deterred, we tried two of them, aimed onto the same spot. As you can see, the results are not consistent. We will talk about this later. This piece of kit, is a mini laser engraver. The ratings label states it has a wavelength of 448 nanometers, an output power less than 800 milliwatts, and as such, is a class 4 device. We previously tested the wavelength of this engraver, using a different spectrometer, and confirmed that the wavelength is correct. So, now we just need to measure the laser power. Unfortunately, this is not so easy to do, this engraver does not have a mode of operation that keeps the beam in a static location. Here, the beam strength is set for maximum, and we do not see a reading that exceeds 600 milliwatts. The whole reason we got this laser power meter, is because we bought this, a monster laser. This thing claims to be an 800 milliwatt, DPSS device, and it doesn't even have a ratings label. This laser, tops out at about 650 milliwatts, we are going to have to be very careful where we point this thing. Making these measurements is all jolly splendid and whatnot, but how do we know that this device is actually giving useful results? I guess, some of you were already wondering about that too. After all, we don't have another calibrated power meter to compare with, and we don't have a calibrated light source either. However, what we do have, is a secret weapon, called Brainiac 75. This superhero YouTuber called Brian, has already tested this power meter, and what Brian has is a calibrated laser power meter, which he used to compare his results with. So, what Brian found was that the results agreed within a tolerance of about 7% of his calibrated instrument. If we allow for a tolerance stack up, due to errors in the reference power meter, we are probably safe to assume that this is accurate to within about 10%. So, whilst this is certainly no precision instrument, and it is nowhere near as accurate as the 2% that it claims, it can still be a very useful device. For example, these two lasers have very different power output levels, but due to the response of the camera and the human eye, the red laser appears to have a similar brightness to the violet laser, despite being 60 times lower power. If there is one thing that we dislike on this channel, it is products that are difficult to tear down. Fortunately, this miniature power meter has just 8 screws that need to be removed, to allow the product to be fully disassembled. As soon as the product was opened, straight away something became abundantly clear. This was going to be a very brief teardown process. You see, there are basically only three components that are responsible for the laser power measurement process. This is a Peltier heat pump, also known as a thermoelectric cooler. This is the power sensor, and we will talk about how this works later on. There is a heat sink attached to the rear side of the Peltier device. This is needed to maintain the inboard side of the heat pump at a constant temperature. This part is a digital panel meter. It is a pre-made solution, often used by hobbyists. This one is made by a company with a totally unpronounceable name, I guess they just took the initials of their Chinese company name, and out of pure laziness, just used it as their English company name. This is a potentiometer, which is used to calibrate the device. Here, is the battery charging circuit. This is the battery. And finally, the power switch. This one is LED illuminated. And that's it. If we look at the components that are part of the circuit that are responsible for actually making a power measurement, we get this simple schematic. When I look at this circuit, 
suddenly the $80 costs, seems like a very steep price to pay. This is a Peltier effect heat pump. When electric current is passed through it, heat energy is taken from one side and passed to the other. This has the effect of making one side of the device become colder, whilst the other gets hotter. Here you can see that happening in the thermal camera image, the dark square is the cool side of the heat pump, and on the other side, we can see that heat is then released. It does need to be pointed out though, that these devices are horribly inefficient as a refrigeration technology. But, this effect is reversible. So if we apply heat or cooling to one side, an electric current will be produced. And this is the basic working principle behind this laser power meter. The laser beam heats one side of the Peltier device and a small current is produced, that is recorded on the display. To convert this optical power to heat, the Peltier device needs to be painted black, so as to be able to absorb as much of the incident energy as possible. So, let's look at what happens when we shine a violet laser onto our improvised power sensor. As you can see, there is a current produced. This type of sensor is often called a thermopile. Until we researched this video, we were completely unaware that many of the lower cost laser power meters use this, rather innovative technique. When we shine this red laser onto the thermopile, you can see the surface heating up, and again the meter records a value that is proportional to the laser power. We thought we would do a little experiment, to see how linear this relationship actually is. So, here is the experiment we are going to run, we have built a basic thermopile, but instead of using a laser, we are going to use a heating resistor to supply the thermal energy. Here, is how we constructed our experimental thermopile, from a Peltier effect device. We used a heat sink on the cold side of the device, to keep it as close to ambient temperature as possible. On the hot side, we used a power resistor. This is a very convenient, and controllable source of thermal power. We can precisely control this energy flow, with just a bench power supply. And finally we added a wind cover. This helps to keep any convection at a constant rate during the experiment. We wanted to be able to view the experiment in progress, using a thermal camera, so the wind cover needed to be transparent to thermal photons. For this we used polythene food wrapping film. This overly elaborate cover, was constructed because we were not able to just use a glass or polycarbonate enclosure, those kinds of materials, are totally opaque to thermal infrared radiation. Here, you can see the comparison between the visible and the thermal infrared views, when looking through various materials. But as you can see here, our polythene enclosure is very transparent to both visible, and thermal wavelengths. Right. Let's run this experiment. Here we are logging the output voltage of the thermopile, the applied heating voltage, and also the temperature of the resistor. We are gradually increasing the applied power, giving time for the system to reach thermal equilibrium. Because of the large mass of the resistor, we are waiting for 5 minutes between each increase in the power. I probably went a bit overboard, on the preparations for this experiment, but my human assistant has a pretty bad reputation for screwing up, even my best planned experiments. We are going to be pushing the power up to about 2 watts, but only a small fraction of that power will be conducted to the thermopile sensor, the majority will be lost to radiation and convection losses. Looking at the raw data collected, here you can see the applied heating voltage, and also the output voltage from the thermopile. The thermopile output voltage follows a square law relationship, which is to be expected. The input power increases with the square of the applied heater voltage. 
This is the raw temperature data from the heater resistor, which again, follows a square law relationship. If we take the average of the stabilized temperatures, we get a really accurate square law curve, even with only 11 data points. So, if we graph the actual applied power versus the measured voltage, we get a really nice straight line. There is one small anomaly though. Right at the bottom of the graph. It is almost like there is a minimum activation energy required. Maybe this is caused by a band gap effect of the semiconductor materials, used in the thermoelectric module. Or perhaps this is just a measurement error. If this is a real effect, it might go some way to explain how we got the curious result of, 1 plus 1 equals 4. If anyone has any ideas about this, please do let us know in the comments. Overall, we think that this little product is pretty useful. It isn't terribly accurate, and it can hardly be considered a scientific instrument. But it is a far better judge of optical power, than the human eye. When it comes to assessing the brightness of monochromatic light sources, the human eye is pretty lacking. This is particularly bad when it comes to wavelengths at each end of the visible spectrum, such as blues or reds. This violet laser is a good example. The device label states it has a power output of less than 1 milliwatt, which means a user should not really need to wear eye protection. We would never have guessed, that in reality the optical power output, is close to 60 times higher than the specification, and for sure, is a serious danger to unprotected eyes. Whilst its absolute accuracy is low, the relative accuracy will be good enough to make some basic absorption measurements, such as testing filters, or even laser protection goggles. The product is about as basic as any that we have seen, the designers didn't really put a lot of effort into improving the accuracy, or the overall functionality of the device. And it is not the only laser power meter on the market that operates using this principle. This dogshit ugly laser bee, is pretty similar but costs over four times as much. But to be honest, the laser bee is to laser power meters, what the Gamma Scout, is to Geiger counters. The basic principle of operation is kind of interesting. What makes this a smart idea is that the only wavelength correction that is needed, is to ensure that the black coating has an equal absorption coefficient, across the optical frequencies of interest. Having run an experiment with a thermo pile, we are pretty sure that we could design, a far better laser power meter, and based around the same principle of operation. Please do let us know in the comments, if that is something that you think would make for an interesting video topic. Making this video was quite rewarding, before we bought this product, we had never considered how these things actually worked. So we learned something new. Anyway, that's all we have for you today. We hope you enjoyed our little video, or at least found some parts of it interesting. If you think we deserve it, then please feel free to give it a like. And you could always hit subscribe, if you want to see more content like this. In a change from our normal practice, we have enabled YouTube advertising. We are saving up for a camera. All of the photography you have seen in our videos, has been captured using a cell phone, the limitations of which, is starting to limit the kind of content we can produce. As you can see, our attempts at generating advertising revenue have been pretty pitiful so far. This is still a hobby channel, so we can say what we want, and YouTube's algorithm can go and get f***ed. Thank you for your time.